will be in the epistle of 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 and verse number 9, the Bible says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And this morning I'd like to preach on new life in Christ, the effect of new life in Christ. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to preach your word, and Lord, as we've enjoyed the fellowship and the worship this morning, we ask that you would prepare our hearts to receive truth from your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would illumine our hearts and our minds, that we would understand this passage, but also apply it and be obedient to it. I pray that you would fill me, give me the boldness and wisdom to explain this passage. I pray for your honor, for your glory, that you would speak to all of our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. New life in Christ. This epistle of John here in 1 John is a letter that was written to encourage Christians. It was a letter written to Christian people. And throughout the book of 1 John, you'll see the common phrase, little children. Little children. Why? He's referring to Christians as little children because God is our Heavenly Father. Amen. And so he commonly refers to us as that. That's who he's writing to. And if you go with me to 1 John chapter 1, he explains the purpose for this letter. One of the main ideas of this letter is in 1 John chapter 1 verse 3. He says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That's talking about Jesus Christ. We say, hey, we know him, we've seen him, we've handled him, and we declare him unto you. That ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And so He wants believers to be assured of their relationship with Jesus, that we can have fellowship with Jesus. And when you have fellowship with Jesus, verse 4, your joy will be full. You won't have full joy if you don't have fellowship with Jesus. But here in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 9, John mentions something very interesting. In fact, it's a verse that troubles some Bible readers. The fact that he says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Well, first of all, the sister passage to 1 John 3 is the gospel of John chapter 3. And there, our Lord is speaking to a man by the name of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a religious leader, a highly educated man. He knows the law of the the Old Testament. But Jesus comes to him and says, Nicodemus, I know you're a teacher. I know you know the Bible. I know you're a very religious man. But Nicodemus, you must be born again. He looks Nicodemus dead in the eyes and says, you must be born again. And listen, whenever Jesus says must with something, we would be fools to disregard that commandment, wouldn't we? We would be fools to disregard it or try to explain away what he might mean. He's telling Nicodemus that your only hope of going to heaven, your only hope of entering the kingdom of God is being born again. And it's it's sad to say, but many so-called Christian people even try to explain that commandment away. So you hear things like people saying, well, being born again, that's, that's just an old-fashioned, archaic term that we can't use today in light of modern science and modern psychology. And so we don't believe in that born-again stuff. Well, I don't know why churches say that, because the Bible teaches it. And Jesus preached it. He said, you must be born again. And so it's sad, but people try to explain being born again away. They say, well, man simply has to rehabilitate himself. They say that man can change himself little by little, achievements and progress, and man can be saved. The Bible says the exact opposite. The Bible says that we are bound to sin, literally slaves to sin, that no amount of human rehabilitation can fix our sin nature We can't fix ourselves. The resources of humanity can't fix us. The government can't fix us. 
Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can transform a sinner to being lost to now being saved. The gospel teaches us that we must be born again, literally that we need to be transformed, not reformed, but transformed. Not rehabilitation, but divine transformation. And Jesus said you must be born again. Now, what is meant by being born again? In fact, that's the question Nicodemus asked, and our Lord had to explain that it's not a physical being born again, it's spiritual. And he explained that the sinner who repents and trusts Christ and is saved, the Holy Spirit does a work inside of him. The Holy Spirit does a work in transforming him from the inside out. You know, a lot of times as men, we try to work from the outside in. Well, give a man a new job, give him some nice clothes, give him a better education, give him a better environment, then he'll be good. The gospel says, no, we must be changed from the inside out. And the gospel does that. It goes right to our hearts. And Jesus explained that this is a work of the Holy Spirit. He said, you know, it's like the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can see the results of the wind. And when the Holy Spirit transformed a life, you can't see that transformation inside. You can't put it under a microscope and examine it. But you know what? You will see the result. You will see the effect of a new life in Christ. There ought to be genuine change now that a sinner is saved. And this is the new birth. This is new life in Christ. And this morning, I want us to consider all that that means. Because a lot of people are so confused. You know, you talk to sinners, you invite them to church, or you tell them you need to be saved, you need to be born again. And they'll say things like, well, uh, I agree with what you're saying, but first I got to get some things cleaned up in my life first. First, I got to take care of a few things and make some changes in my life, and then I'll, I'll follow the advice that you're giving me. And they completely miss the point. You see, you don't change your life first and then go to Jesus. You go to Jesus and he changes your life. He washes you. He makes you clean. He makes you new. And so some sinner that has an alcohol problem says he feels bad about trusting Christ or coming to church. Listen, Christ will take care of your alcohol problem. Christ will take care of that anger problem. Christ will take care of that bitterness. You come to Jesus and he'll change you and make you new. That's the gospel. And so we have to emphasize this new birth, this new life in Christ. And for us as Christians, I want us to consider how it ought to radically change our lives. When you were born again, your life was changed. My life was changed forever. So I want us to consider the new life in Christ. Number one, the need for new life. The need for new life. You know, contrary to popular belief, not everyone is a child of God. I suppose if you went up and down the street and did a poll... Most people would say, oh, yeah, we're all the children of God. How many of you have ever heard that? We're all the children of God. You know, that's just not true. The Bible does not teach that. If you look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10, the Bible says, In this the children of God are manifest, that's one group of people, and the children of the devil, there's another grouping. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So the Bible does not teach that we are all the children of God. In fact, the Bible teaches the exact opposite. The Bible teaches that sinners without Christ are not children of God. In fact, they are children of the devil. See, the Bible doesn't pull any punches. It tells us who we really are. It's a full-length mirror. It doesn't hide the fact that we are sinners. The Bible says that one without Christ is a slave to sin, is dead to sin, and the punishment for that sin is eternal damnation in a place called hell. For the wages of sin is death. That's spiritual death. That's eternal damnation in the lake of fire. That's the penalty for our sin. And the Bible teaches that we were born with this sinful nature. We're sinners by choice and by birth. And we have this this condition of of sinfulness And we have to answer this question, can God allow sin into heaven? And the answer, of course, is no. God is a holy God, a perfect God. Heaven's a perfect and holy place. And so we have a problem. Something has to be done about our sin if we are to enter the kingdom of God, enter into heaven. And that's why Jesus said you must 
be born again. You see, when a sinner repents of his sin and trusts in Jesus Christ alone, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and you were born again, you're transformed, and you're born again into God's family. And now you, you can enter into heaven. If you look with me at 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, what can be done about our sin problem? The Bible says, and you know that he, that's Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Jesus was revealed. Jesus came to earth to take away our sin. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's our problem. That's our condition. And he came to meet that need. But you know, we can never accept Christ until we first realize we need Christ. Sometimes we talk to sinners. We say, hey, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? They say, well, I'm doing the best I can. Well, I'm trying my best. I'm working hard at it. And they miss it because you can't do enough to forgive yourself and to avoid the penalty of sin. Only Jesus Christ can do that for you. We cannot take away the penalty of our own sin. We cannot overcome the power of sin. Only Jesus can do that. And that's why he was manifested. That's why he was revealed. And so what the Bible is teaching is that the salvation experience is not a work that you do or that I do. It's a work that Jesus does in us and through us. We simply receive it by faith. He's the Savior. I'm the sinner. He did all the work. He died on the cross, the Bible says, not for his own sin, but for all of our sin. He was buried and he rose again, conquering sin, death, and hell. All I simply have to do is trust and receive that by faith. That's the gospel. That's salvation. The Bible says in John 1 verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's the new birth. That's new life. That's regeneration. Now let me say what the new life, what the new birth is not. The new birth is not going to church every Sunday. That doesn't make you a Christian. You know how I know that? Because the devil goes to church every Sunday too. In fact, he probably goes to church more than any of us. He keeps very busy in churches, in fact. So it's not just going to church that makes you a believer, a Christian. Making a new resolution. From this day forward, I'm going to stop getting so angry at my family. From this day forward, I'm going to stop lying. That's, that's great. That's noble. But that's not the new birth. That's not salvation. No, all the prayers, getting baptized, keeping the sacraments, doing good works, keeping the golden rule, none of those things can save you. Those are all works of men. Only Jesus Christ can save you. Only the Holy Spirit can regenerate you and make you new from the inside out. So this is the new birth. And you can't experience this unless you first realize you need it. And by the way, this teaching of the new birth means that you cannot say, I have always been a Christian. Because the fact is, we were born not as Christians, as believers. We were born as sinners. David said in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. We were all born with this sinful nature the first time, physically. We need to be born again spiritually to become the children of God. Have you been born again? Have you received Jesus Christ? Have you received forgiveness and has he made you new by his Holy Spirit? That's the question this morning. But then number two, if you have, number two, let's consider the effects of new life in Christ. If you go with me to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, the Bible says, 1 John 5 verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Verse 4, says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Second Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 
He is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's the new birth experience. And the result is that all things are new. The Bible is teaching us that there is a great change. You see, we were once children of the devil, without Jesus, without hope. But when we came to Jesus, we became the children of God. Something so dramatic, something so radical of a shift ought to produce a change in someone's life, amen? There ought to be a difference now that you are saved. You see, when we were born of God, our old nature, which was patterned after Adam and his disobedience to God, our old nature is now destroyed and now we have a new nature in Christ, patterned after his obedience. And we have this change. We're new creatures, the Bible says, new creations. And it's interesting, nature gives us, and a wonderful illustration of this, I believe, when you think of the butterfly and the metamorphosis of a caterpillar to a butterfly. You know, the caterpillar roams around on the dirt. That's all he can do is stay on the dirt. He's blind. He can't see much, can't do much. He's just trying to roll around and eat dirt. But then a wonderful transformation takes place, and he becomes a beautiful butterfly. Now he can see, he can fly and soar the skies. It's incredible, the change that takes place. And there's a difference. Well, you take an old sinner, bound to sin, bound to all the wicked vices of this world, gambling, alcohol, lying, uh, lust, all the wickedness of this world he's a slave to, and now he's born again. You better believe there ought to be a dramatic change because Christ has made the difference. There's a new change in our lives. And so let's look back at our text, 1 John 3, verse 9. Let's look a little closer at what John is teaching us here. 1 John 3, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. What is John teaching here? Well, first, he's emphasizing what it means to be born again. That there's transformation, there's change. Now, I'll, I'll, I will say this. This change sometimes is more dramatic in others and less dramatic in some. You take someone that was saved as a child and someone that perhaps lived a long life and had a long laundry list of sin, there'll be a more dramatic change, I'm sure. But there still should be a change. Now, what he's not teaching in this verse is sinless perfection. He's not saying when you get saved, you'll never sin again. In fact, let's go to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. 1 John 2 verse 1, he says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. That's God's will, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. There's the provision for sin. Let's go back to 1 John 1 verse 8. 1 John 1 verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John is not teaching that uh, a believer will be perfect, will be sinless. It's not sinless perfection, but he is, I believe, teaching a sinless provision. There is a provision made that Christians may sin, but Christians do not have to sin. Before we were saved, we were sinners and we had to sin. Sin was our master. We were slaves and, and, bound, and bondage to sin. We could not say no to sin. But now as believers, something took place and something is living inside of us that gives us the power to say no to sin. This is very important for Christians that when you come to Jesus Christ, when you're born again, the new birth results in this power, this ability to reject sin, to reject temptation. And so what does this mean? It means that our very nature is different, so the practice of sin should not be a part of our lives. So what John is teaching here in 1 John 3, 9, the practice, the continual habit of sin, the continual practice of sin should not be a part of a Christian's life. Let me give you an example. I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm a gay Christian. I'm a Christian, but I'm still staying in my homosexual lifestyle. Nuh-uh, it doesn't work. 
It doesn't work. The Bible says that you cannot commit sin. You will not continue living and practicing sin. It would be like someone saying, I'm a liar and I'm going to continue lying. I have no plans on changing that. Hey, I'm a, I'm a bitter person. I have no plans on not being bitter. I'm not going to change that even though I'm a Christian. It doesn't work. I question that person's salvation that says that, that lives that way. Now, the Bible says a true believer, not a make-believer, a true believer will not live in this continual practice of habitual sin. That's also what he means in 1 John 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. In other words, you won't keep living in the slop of sin. So here's what the Bible is teaching. Not sinless perfection, but a sinless provision. It's Jesus Christ. He was manifested to take away our sin. Not only the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. So Christians, we don't have to sin. So let me ask you a question this morning. Why do Christians sin? Or maybe to be more specific, why do you sin? Why do Christians get so angry? Why do Christians get so bitter? Why do Christians turn to alcohol and gambling and vices? Why do Christians uh, uh, do things to, to di disobey God's commandments and God's laws? Why do Christians do all these things? Oh, I believe, first of all, they ought to examine, are they truly saved? Are they truly born again? But secondly, maybe they're not abiding in Christ, as the Bible teaches us here. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But John is emphasizing, and I want to emphasize this morning, that there needs to be a change. There's a song we teach children. There's a great change since I've been born again. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Hey, the things I used to wear, I don't wear them anymore. There's a great change since I've been born again. Listen, there's a difference in the way we think now that we're born again. Our thought patterns are different. You know, sinners before Christ, maybe we were very selfish. We only thought about how things can benefit us. What's in it for me? I'm number one. But now as a Christian, when you're born again, now your thoughts about others. How can I be a blessing to others and how can I be a blessing to God? Our thought patterns are different. Maybe before we were envious and jealous. I want my neighbor's car. I want my neighbor's house. And we're so envious and jealous. But now that we're in Christ, we ought not have that thought pattern. Maybe before we were bitter, angry people. We were irritable. Now that we're born again, should we still think that way? Or should there be a change? You know, there's a difference in our worldview. The way we view our culture, the way we interact with our culture ought to be different because we've been born again. We have different goals in life. Maybe before Christ, your life is all about making money, having friends, living for pleasure. But now you've been born again, you're living for something more. As a believer, we have different morals. We have a different lifestyle, a different way we talk, different way we live, different uh, entertainment that we have, the music we listen to, the things we watch, ought to be different, right? Why do Christian people then go back to the slop of this world after they've been born again? There should be a change. God wants us to be a distinct people, a holy people, a different people. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 22. Ephesians 4 verse 22. And Paul says that you put off concerning the former conversation. That word means lifestyle. That you put off the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He's teaching, now that you've come to Christ, now that you have Jesus Christ, put off the old man, the old nature, the old way of doing things. Now there's a difference. Verse 24, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands a thing which is good, that he may have to give that him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication 
proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good, to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Do you see there's a difference in the way the world does things and the way Christians live their lives? Is there a difference in the way you live your life? Is there a difference in how you talk? Is there a difference in the music you listen to, in the way you dress, the way you interact with the world? Is there a difference? Or are you living just like the sinners that don't have Christ? If so, there's a big problem. There's a huge problem. In fact, it may mean maybe you're not born again. That could be the issue. Oh, I'm convinced our churches all across America are full of Christians in name only that have never truly experienced the new birth. And they're no wonder they're living the same old, plain Jane, worldly life that everyone else is living. No change. Let's go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. It says, Only let your conversation, again, your lifestyle, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You see, we have to live a lifestyle that matches our testimony. If we proclaim that we're born again, that we're saved, let's live like it. And that brings me to my, my final point this morning. Abiding in Christ is the source of new life. Abiding in Christ. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 3. Maybe this morning you realize there needs to be a change. There needs to be a difference. The sin of my life has to go. The answer is not doing it yourself. The answer is abiding in Christ. You see, the new life that we have is not just a repackaging of the old life. It's not just change here a little, change there a little. It's a completely new life. In fact, it's the life of Jesus Christ that's living out through me. The Bible says here in verse, uh, verse number 5, it says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Let's go to verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. I mentioned that this passage does not teach sinless perfection, but a sinless provision. And what God's word is teaching here is that when you trusted Christ, when you repented of your sins, something of the very nature of God was embedded into your life and mine. This divine life force was placed into you, placed into me. And it transforms us. And it's the very life of Jesus Christ. And it's this life of Jesus Christ that gives us victory over sin. It's this life of Jesus Christ that changes us, that radically alters our lives forever. And so it's not about gritting your teeth and saying, I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get angry. And what happens? You get angry and you blow up. It's not about trusting in your flesh. It's about abiding in Christ and His power to live His life through you. That's abiding in Christ. That's sinning not. You see, the Bible teaches that when you abide in Christ, when you're walking in the Spirit, you will not sin. You cannot sin. You cannot live a defeated, sinful life. I'll put it to you this way. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Paul explains it as well in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Galatians 5 verse 16. The Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And that shall not is an emphatic 
negative. You cannot fulfill the lust of the flesh. It is impossible to be walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh at the same time. If you're walking in the spirit and you're abiding in Christ, you will not be walking in the flesh and living a sinful life. That's what the Bible is teaching. So here we go. Here it is. So if in my life, I'm struggling with sin. I, I'm getting angry. I'm turning to the, the wickedness of this world, the vices of this world, the alcohol, gambling, the immorality. If in my life there's the anger, there's the bitterness, if in my life there's no victory over sin, that is evidence that I'm not abiding in Christ and I'm not walking in the Spirit and I'm walking in the flesh. See, those moments when we lose our temper, we tell that lie. We think that wrong thought. It's evidence that we're not abiding in Christ. So we need to abide in Christ. Okay, well, what does it mean to abide? To abide means to live, to continue, or to remain. And we can do this in several ways. First, it starts with a, an attitude of submission to Christ's commands. We say, Lord, I want to obey everything you tell me. That we order our lives around God's word, not the other way around. And we have this spirit of total submission. Lord, I want to do everything that you desire for me to do. That's how you can abide. You can abide in Christ by allowing his word to fill your mind and your heart, to change your affections from worldly things to spiritual things. Maybe you have such an appetite for the things of this world. Well, when you abide in Christ, he changes your appetite. He changes your affections. That's what it means to abide in Christ. And when we do that, we will live that changed life, that life of distinction and separation from the world. The Christian that is truly abiding in Christ will live a holy life because Jesus is holy. And if his life is being lived out and I'm, I'm abiding in him, then I will live a holy life too. Do you follow me there? And so this idea of being born again, it starts with salvation, but it's also living the Christian life, continually abiding in Christ. And with that union, I can be saved and also holy, live a holy life. That's what Jesus taught in John chapter 15. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he was teaching that he is the source and we live out from that source all that he is his power, His grace, His glory. This morning, are you abiding in Him? Is there a difference in your life? Is there a change in your life? I read an interesting illustration of a man who was 50 years old, who had been blind since he was a child. And at the age of 50, he underwent surgery, which gave him sight. He was able to see for the very first time. But, as he would soon find out, having the capacity to see is not the same thing as seeing. In other words, having sight doesn't all of a sudden make life great. He had to learn how to cope with seeing colors and movement and putting it all together to make sense in his mind. And someone said this, he had to learn to die to the habits and behaviors of a blind man and live to the habits and behaviors of a seeing man. Listen, when we come to Jesus Christ, we have to realize that we are dead to the old nature. We're dead to sin and we're alive in Christ. So all the old habits, the old way of doing things, it's over. And now we have to learn a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a new behavior, a new outlook on life because we've been born again. And the Bible says that we don't do this in our own power. In our own strength, we do it by abiding in the power, the source, Jesus Christ. Have you been born again? Again, I'm not asking, are you a religious person? Are you a church-going person? I'm asking, have you been born again? And if so, are you abiding in Christ this morning? If there's sin in your life, you don't have to live in sin because Christians don't do that. You can find forgiveness, restoration, and victory by looking to Christ and abiding in Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. Lord, we pray that we would have this understanding that we need new life, 
you give us that new life when we come to you in faith. And Lord, our lives ought to be different. There ought to be a change since we've been born again. Lord, my prayer is that if there's anyone here that's lost, that they would trust Christ and be gloriously saved. And that also for God's people, for believers, that we would live that life of distinction, of change, to reflect what you've done for us. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, I wonder how many could say, Pastor, I know for sure that I'm saved. I know for sure that I've been born again. That's my testimony. Could you raise your hand nice and high and say, I know for sure that I'm saved. Well, praise the Lord. Many hands are up. You can put your hands down. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I've been born again. I need prayer. Would you please pray for me? I need to be saved. God, speak into me. Would you slip your hand up? We'll pray for you now. I'm not sure if I'm born again. I want to get this settled. Now's the time. The Bible is clear that Jesus Christ took our place on the cross to die for our sins. If we trust him, he'll forgive us and make us new. How about you, Christian, this morning? Are you living in sin? Is there unconfessed sin that needs to be dealt with? Have you been giving in to your flesh, or have you been abiding in Christ, living out that transformed life? I'm going to ask our pianist to play a hymn of invitation, and I want to give us a moment to pray. You can seek and find forgiveness and commit yourself to abiding in Christ. Allow him to radically change your life. If he's changed our lives, let's commit that we're not going back. He's changed us forever. We put off the old man. Father, we thank you so much for the salvation that we can enjoy in Christ. Lord, I pray that that would be a reality for all of us, that we've had that born-again transformation by your Spirit. And Lord, I pray that we would live our lives in light of that. Lord, help us to continue abiding in you. Forgive us for those moments where we walk in the flesh and we fail. Lord, help us to be honest, to find forgiveness and cleansing, and to go on abiding in you. Lord, you've changed us forever. Lord, help us to continue to trust in your spirit and to embrace that change. Lord, help us not to be worldly-minded. Help us not to be envious. Help us not to uh, go back uh, on what you've changed us from. I pray you'd help us to continue going forward in full victory. For your honor and your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together and let's sing number 535. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Page 535. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus 
saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Amen. Let's remain standing and let's close with a word of prayer. I invite you to come back tonight at 6.30. We'll be having a service uh, preaching on Nehemiah chapter 4. So be in your place tonight. But let's close now with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the privilege it was to be in your house, to worship, fellowship, and hear your word. And would you help us to go forth in obedience to all that you've shown us this morning. And I pray that you would bless our departing and bring us back again safely for tonight's meeting. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.